Good evening and welcome to News 360 from the News Up here at the Sanway Accra. I am Issa Moni. And I am Porsche Gabo. Coming up the headlines. Some parents in northern region resort to family planning methods in safeguarding their daughters with intellectual disabilities against teenage pregnancy. And also coming up, Ghana loses $50 million due to illegal fishing activities by foreign trawlers in our waters. Ghana Health Service to buy health service workers from using mobile phones while on duty. On Mission Tonight, we'll tell you the story of a 29-year-old battling stigma and rejection owing to a problem with her spine. International News U.S. President Donald Trump warns Iran of total destruction if there is war between the two countries. We have details coming up shortly. Do stay with us. In our very first story, childlessness can be a traumatizing and a painful experience for most couples, especially in Africa. Women without children are more often stigmatized and branded barren even when they become fertile. Later on, Ajwa Adobiowusu tells the story of a couple's travail to end their childlessness and a 90-year-old childless woman. Childbearing is considered a huge part of a female's life cycle and viewed by many communities in Ghana as a big achievement. Society regards children as the most important asset in every successful marriage and for this reason, childless couples become an object of ridicule. You don't know love till you're a mother or what benefits are you to society if you don't have a child. Throughout our lives as women, we have had to face numerous comments from people. We have had to answer questions about our wombs and ovaries. Yet, the contribution by childless women in society cannot be overlooked. That is the story of 90-year-old Janet Duncan. 90-year-old Janet Duncan was married for 15 years without a child of her own. For all those years, she and her husband visited various places for solution, but to no avail. Her husband was her backbone, but it was short-lived when her husband passed on. She nursed pain for a long time. <laughs> Janet, who was a trader in her youth, seized the opportunity to extend a helping hand to others. She became a fountain of pillar for children whose parents were never available. But Janet is not worried about her situation as she is hopeful she will leave an indelible mark when she departs. Nana Osei, a fertility counselor and the president of the Association of Childless Couples, says the stigma couples face is psychological. If you live under false pretense, that is where you have issues. I'm saying false pretense because if you don't have something and then you pretend as if you have, that is where the problem is. A lot of people feel that they are stigmatized. But having done this work for more than six years, I can tell you that the stigma that we talk about that is really confronting um, childless couples or people with infertility are actually within them. A senior lecturer with the Department of Social and Behavioral Science at the University of Ghana thinks otherwise. 
when there is that attempt to have a child and it is failing then there is that is associated with you know some severe emotions you know and that emotion i must say you know can be very challenging um, it can be a very devastating experience because uh, quite apart from what you are thinking people in the society i mean ignorantly will be as it were be pointing fingers sometimes you know be asking questions so what support systems are in place for childless persons especially women And in this segment tonight, this week was perhaps the most trying in recent times for Ghana-Nigeria relations. In our story of the week today, Kwache Afre Nyama catalogs all the key developments that threaten the long-standing ties between the two countries. Ghana and Nigeria have a long history, a history that goes beyond post-independence era. But all the years of healthy bilateral relationship faced its biggest test this week. In fact, it is fair to say the strength of that relationship is still being tested. It all started with a strongly worded statement by the Nigerian High Commissioner to Ghana. In the two-page statement, he expressed strong reservations about crime reporting by the media. In most cases, in his view, the media targets Nigerians, a situation he fears could breed xenophobia. The Foreign Affairs Committee of Parliament waded into that conversation on Tuesday. In a joint news conference, the majority and minority caucus on the committee indicated that they will intervene. We have sent a word to uh, the Nigerian High Commissioner uh, to Ghana. We will be meeting him. Uh, we think that there is no cause of worry. Let him come and appear before the committee as the chairman has, has, has indicated. And then we will ask the relevant questions. We will find out if he indeed altered that statement and all of that. Before that dust could settle, Nigerian professor Augustin Magbara was captured in a video that has now gone viral on social media. He made comments that many have described as inappropriate. We have powerful Nigerian media stations. Let them come. Look at what you have said here today. Let them come here and run documentaries of the experiences of Nigerians and blast it all over the world. Professor Magbara was invited by the police CID on Tuesday and was cautioned on the offense of offensive conduct conducive to the breach of peace. Swiftly, the University of Ghana also issued a statement on the same day condemning his comments. The university clarified that he was no longer a member of their faculty as his last appointment there was in July 2012. There were tougher times ahead for Professor Magbara. The University of Education Winneba in a press statement announced that they had instituted disciplinary action against him. The university dismissed him and described his comment as unsavory and unethical. In an interesting twist, however, the Academic Staff Union of Universities in Nigeria launched a spirited defense of Professor Nagbara's conduct. The group described particularly the sanctions by the UEW as unfair. While all this was unfolding, trouble was brewing in the Ashanti region, specifically at the spare pass hub Swami Magazine. Ghanaian traders there accused their Nigerian counterparts of engaging in retail business illegally. They, among other things, locked up their shops. The regional police command later managed to restore calm in the area. In a statement, it said, among other things, that it was collaborating with the military to forestall further chaos. Meanwhile, Guta at Habosokai in Accra declared full support for their counterparts in the Ashanti region. We are in solidarity to our friends in Swami. When you see institutional failure, when, when certain people who need to react are not doing so, this is the results that you get. International relations expert Dr. Rashid Haruna projects dire consequences of these developments if they are not handled with tact. Whatever 
happens with Nigerians in Ghana, there's a, a chance, just like Shagari did, you know, uh, when the aliens compliance order was done, there could be the retaliatory effects or actions taken by the Nigerians. The coming days indeed promises to be interesting as the Foreign Affairs Ministry and other state agencies take steps to resolve this impasse. In other news, the Director General of the Ghana Health Service, Dr. Antonin Siasari, has hinted of plans to bar health service workers from using mobile phones while on duty. This is to ensure discipline at the health centers during service delivery, and he made this revelation at the inauguration ceremony of some three polyclinics in the Greater Accra region. The three polyclinics are each located at Sege in the Adan West District, Community 22 at Shaiman and Ogbojo at Dentan, all in the Greater Accra region. The facility is among the five polyclinics government secured a 13.5 million euros loan to construct. They were built in partnership with the Australian government to pursue the country's goal of achieving the Sustainable Development Goal 3 of universal health coverage for all by 2030. The 30 bed capacity facilities with the same architectural design are to provide OPD services, diagnostics, maternity and pediatric care, and general consultation. The Director General of the Ghana Health Service, Dr. Anthony Insia Sari, said the practice of health service workers using their phones while attending to patients is becoming a serious issue that must be dealt with. He fears the distraction from the phones contributes to the wrong administration of drugs to patients. The use of mobile phone first doesn't show any respect, especially when you are seeing somebody. The use of mobile phone distracts you. Mobile phones also have some vibrational effects on some of the gadgets. I have sent a message around and I think I'm going to enforce it. The best way outside in other degradation is that you enter a facility that is the networks don't work. The Minister of Health, Kweku Ajiman Menu, used the occasion to debunk claims that government has abandoned health projects started by the previous administration. The bashing on the Minister for Health for abandoning projects that were started. This is enough evidence. When we came, there was not a single block here. Whatever the previous government did was in the drawing room. But even that, we didn't abandon the project. Neither did we relocate to anywhere. Now they have started talking that Nana Kufuadwa, his government, have borrowed so much and they don't know what we have done with the money. This is one of them. Some residents share their joy about the construction of the polyclinics in their vicinities. <laughs> We are very happy with the location of the clinic. Please attend to us with care when we come. The facilities are to complement other health centers in the district to improve health care delivery. You're watching News 360 and there is more to come this hour. Stay with us. Hello again, it's now time for Mission, and Mission is supported by Star Ghana Foundation with thanks to Danida, UK Aid, and the EU. She's battled stigma and rejection since childhood due to a problem with her spine. Now 29 years, Diana Sean hopes to benefit from the 3% District Assembly Common Fund for Persons with Disability to enable her empower other women with disability. Twenty-nine-year-old Dinah Sean was not born this way. She began to have problems with her spine at age six. Despite being to several hospitals, her condition has not been treated. Her parents then took her to churches and prayer centers for a solution, but this too proved futile. Now, 29 years, she's learned to accept her fate. Um, okay. Okay. 
I repeated in school and dropped out several times. After JHS, I worked for someone to teach me how to sew. She's undergoing apprenticeship with a seamstress at Don in the Tonkata Monsoon Municipality in the Greater Accra region. It's like my sister. So when I saw her at the town, I asked her the work she would do. And she told me she wants to be a seamstress. And I said, oh, me too, I'm a seamstress. So if she wants to sew, then she should come to my shop. Every Tuesday, I open the shop and I have some people too who work after me. So she should come and join them so that I can help her to do her work. Although she's head of the 3% District Assembly Common Fund for Persons with Disability, she's not yet a beneficiary. She applied in 2018, but has not yet been called. <laughs> Dinah wants a sewing machine from the fund. This, she says, will enable her support not only her family, but also other persons with disability in her community. If you're a person living with disability, don't hide. Involve yourself in useful activities in your community. She will use the machine to work very well. The assembly, they should help our sisters who said they work, they should help them so that they will do their work very well to help the community. The 3% District Assembly Common Fund for Persons with Disability is a development fund which enables the use of the nation's wealth throughout Ghana to benefit all citizens, especially the vulnerable in society. And as that's for Mission, Mission is supported by Star Ghana Foundation with thanks to Danida, UK Aid and the EU. Thanks so much for watching. Hello again, let's do some more stories tonight. Ghana loses $50 million due to illegal fishing activities by foreign trawlers. In our waters, President of the Chamber of Agri Executive, Anthony Morrison, says this requires swift intervention by government as the country risks losing its fish stock by 2035. An investigative piece published on June 17, 2019 by the Environmental Justice Foundation revealed that cycle fishing, whereby trawlers target the staple catch of Ghanaian canoe fishes and sell it back to fishing communities at a profit, landed approximately 100,000 tons of fish in 2017 worth $50 million when sold at sea and up to $81 million when sold at ports. The incomes of small-scale fishers have dropped by as much as 40% in the past 10 to 15 years, and Ghana is now forced to import more than half of fish consumed. Scientists have warned that stocks could be completely destroyed as early as 2020 if the practice is not curtailed. The findings are very um, awakening in that um, the consequences on the country uh, very um, dreading because um, there'll be lots of jobs, there'll be lots of uh, social and economic uh, viability of fishing communities. Um, there might be certain migration because uh, they wouldn't have access to what they have been doing for all their lives. President of the Chamber of Agri Executives, Anthony Morrison, says government should enforce the laws to keep the practice need to enforce our laws is very important. We need to enforce our laws. Secondly, we need to protect our resources because once the resources are depleting or they deplete, there is nothing we can do to replenish it because uh, there, is no, there are scientific uh, work that has been done on marine population, but um, we have not seen it's actualizing. 
The report indicated that almost two-thirds of the Chinese vessels fishing in West African waters are fishing illegally, costing billions of dollars in lost revenue and rapidly depleting fish stocks. Unicom Cocoa is collaborating with the Ghana Cocoa Board and Rainforest Alliance to support smallholder cocoa farmers with interventions in dealing with droughts, floods and rising temperatures. The warming climate threatens the livelihood of millions of small-scale farmers in the country who depend on cocoa crops to support their families. Climate change, combined with unsustainable farming techniques, has affected cocoa yields in recent times. Some regions have already been rendered totally unsuitable for growing cocoa owing to poor soil as a result of climate change. With a vast majority of the world's cocoa produced by smallholder farmers, the impact of high temperatures could be dire. Unicom and partners are exposing farmers to techniques to build resilience to droughts, floods, higher temperatures and the changing growing seasons. Over the past five years, over 15,000 farmers have been trained on good planting methods, pruning and pesticide application on cocoa farms. At a farmers' forum in Mansung and Memphi in the Western region, speakers were concerned about the effects of climate change on cocoa farms and the quality of cocoa beans produced in the country. General Manager of Unicom, Richard Suli, said 400,000 seedlings have been raised and distributed to farmers to enable them improve on their agricultural productivity. Unicom refocused from just trading in the commodity to providing essential support services to the rural farmer. Chief among them includes our SMS services, that's providing technical and agronomy training to farmers on farm management. Head of Quality Control Division at Cocoa Board, Nanaka Kariadu, urged farmers to help maintain the quality of cocoa beans in the country. The that Cocoa Board Management has, has put in place, the hand foundation, the pruning, the cocoa pest disease and control programs, you take it seriously. And I know that the cocoa production uh, would, would increase, would increase. And that's all for this edition of News 360. And uh, my name is Isamoni. And I am Portia Gabo.